are here for the smart scaling with Carpenter, and we'll tell you why Carpenter is so smart in this session. Uh, so let me start, and I think uh, you already went through this, uh, but we have this up on the KubeCon uh, website, so you can take a look at that as well. So my name is Prasida, and uh, I am um, Principal Container Specialist and also OS Open Source Specialist at AWS. I have uh, my colleagues and my friends over here uh, who will be my uh, co-speakers. They will introduce themselves. So today we are going to talk about Carpenter. Yay. OK, first, uh, raise your hands so who are actually using Cluster Autoscale uh, today. Cluster Autoscaler, yes. So I, I'm assuming that you are here to learn that why I should move to Carpenter, right? Yeah, then you are in the right session. And raise your hands who are already trying Carpenter. Awesome, awesome. OK, you'll learn more. <laughs> OK. So uh, before diving into Carpenter, I would like to talk about what are the challenges, right? Why we need Carpenter. So if you see Cluster Autoscaler, and Carpenter, both are Kubernetes autoscalers, right? Uh, and they work exactly the similar way. But what are the current challenges what users and customers are facing today? So with cluster autoscaler, uh, it has to be associated with the autoscaling groups. So you have node group which are associated to autoscaling groups, and those can only be configured with one instance type, right? And you, before you start about uh, deploying or your workload, you need to make sure that you create those node groups with that certain instance type, right? But what about like another team needs another type of workload? Here, like you can see, GPU workload. And it needs a different type of GPU instances, right? So in that case, uh, currently in Cluster Autoscaler, uh, you have to basically create another node group. And then it will create another autoscaling group for that. Right? And then that workload will uh, be deployed into that node group. Correct? So Carpenter actually removes completely the concept of node group and autoscaling group. Basically, uh, it works with one uh, uh, declarative configuration. You can actually mention what workloads you want to deploy, and it is smart enough to actually uh, spin up the instance for your workload depending upon what resources you have in your pod spec. So what we are see, you can see now the GPU workload is going to this uh, instance, P4D instance, and that's what we talk about Carpenter, that it provides, uh, it provisions appropriate instances based on your pod spec, right? Without any separate node group requirement. And of course, it is faster than Cluster Autoscaler. And I will let you know how it is faster than or cluster autoscaler. So if you see here, uh, it works similarly, right? Like when you see the pending pods, the cluster autoscaler also actually associates itself with the ASG to scale the nodes, and that's how it works. But in Carpenter, it also works with the uh, Carpenter's Cube Scheduler, uh, sorry, Kubernetes Cube Scheduler, and it also watches the pending pods over here, uh, but it, there is no autoscaling group the Carpenter directly calls the VM fleet API to actually spin up the nodes what is required for your, uh, based on your pod specification, and also based, based on the Kubernetes constraints. So it respects the Kubernetes constraints. And it is uh, very simple. It's based on a uh, couple of YAML files, you can say, the configuration. Uh, first one is node pool, uh, which Raj will go through in detail, uh, we can specify the instances, we can specify the availability zones and the architecture type and all those information in there. The next is the node class, where you can specify networking aspects. You can also specify the image family and all those information. So with that, I will hand it over to Raj to see how actually the Carpenter does more than scaling. Thank you, Prasida. Can you guys hear me? Uh, cool. My name is Raj. I'm a principal specialist SA working at AWS for containers and serverless. So yeah, Carpenter, bread and butter is the scaling. However, one of the main reasons Carpenter is becoming more popular is it does more than that. It automatically selects the right-sized and most cost-efficient instances for your workload. 
It supports diverse workloads, including machine learning and Gen AI. And it helps even on in your day to operations, such as upgrades and patching. So we could say that Carpenter is a total data plane implementation. And Carpenter is made with love at AWS, and we donated it to CNCF, so it's part of Kubernetes uh, open ecosystem. OK, so Prasida talked about that you can control the behavior of Carpenter using to YAML file. And that's one of the reasons Carpenter is Kubernetes native, because all of you know YAML. And for those of you who are sitting on the back, your eyes are better than me if you can see this. But don't worry, during the workshop, you will see these YAMLs in practice. So let's go through it. So as you could see in the node pool, under the requirements, you have a lot of control on what kind of EC2 instances Carpenter should provision. So for in this case, we are saying instance category should be in C, M, R, and T. You can also use operators like not in. So you do not want instance size, which is nano, micro, small, or medium. And you can also specify hypervisor and all the other controls. Now, one of the thing is, if you are thinking, oh my god, this is a lot of stuff. How am I going to remember all this? These are all optional. So you can skip putting any of this, and Carpenter will automatically select the best instance type out of 800 different instances that's available. And it always prioritizes cost. You can also specify availability zone in this case. For example, I'm showing that the instances should be provisioned in either US West 2A or US West 2B. And finally, you can limit how many EC2 instances this node pool can provision. So see on the bottom, I'm showing limit CPU 100. So this will keep provisioning EC2s till the aggregate number of vCPU reaches 100. So this is a pretty creative way for different teams to control how many EC2s they can provision. And remember I said Carpenter is Kubernetes native? Carpenter respects Kubernetes scheduling, including node selectors, node affinity, tens and tolerations, and topology spread. So I know all of you are Kubernetes practitioners, so you probably use this in your day to day because you need to separate your workloads, maybe you want to run GPU workloads in GPUs, etc. So let's take a look at this example. On the left, I'm showing a node pool, and Carpenter supports user-defined annotation labels and tens. So you could see the annotation is application name app A, and then there is a label, and then I also have a taint. On your deployment file, you can reuse any of those to schedule your workloads appropriately. So this is just part of a node pool, right? So you can also mix and match. OK, this label for team must use GPUs up to limit 200. And then you just schedule your workload accordingly using those labels. And Carpenter comes with sample well-known lab labels that's automatically added to the node. You don't need to put all this into your node pool. So you can be pretty creative. You could say that, hey, I want an AMD64 architecture, use this label, or I want Carpenter, uh, my pod to be scheduled to operating system Linux, or instance type, or zone, and Carpenter will automatically provision the appropriate instances for you. Now, to talk about how Carpenter saves you cost, I'm going to invite my friend from Microsoft, Wilson, up on the stage. Thank you, Raj. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Wilson Darko, and I am a product manager with the Azure Kubernetes Services team. So really excited to talk about that idea of cost, cost savings, which for many customers is a really big value add or prop for Carpenter. So how do we actually get that cost savings done? Well, one of the core capabilities is through consolidation. As you can see here, consolidation uh, really has two objectives, to either delete or replace your current compute to kind of optimize for bin packing. So as you can see in this example here, we have a couple VMs that are up, and we have within those pods uh, a lot of real estate, as you can see, especially those two 
to the right. So for anyone in the back that can't see, I'm just describing the visual of our slide here. In this situation, there's essentially two ways that consolidation can do this. Uh, one of those is by setting a consolidation policy. A policy is essentially a state-based trigger that once you arrive to either being empty or underutilized as a VM, then Carpenter will recognize that and then take action, either delete or replace. Another consideration is essentially a time-based trigger, which in this case would be consolidate after, which I reference here. So as we see in our next slide, using the consolidation policy, we were able to essentially delete some of the excess VMs that we had there. Uh, but a trade-off of that is just from a, a, a real life standpoint, uh, you probably don't want too much churn taking place during work hours, during any other scenarios, uh, especially after you just did a delete or replace action. So using a consolidation policy exclusively can come with some trade-offs. And with that, that's why we talk about adding the time-based consideration of a consolidate after uh, trigger. So in this case, because we have leveraged consolidate after, we've added essentially an hour gap between when each action will take place in terms of consolidation. And through that, you can now wait an hour after your last pod has been added or removed. And in this case, you kind of have a bit more buffer, si buffer time to work with. So pretty, uh, pretty useful feature here. And as you can see, we were able to do that same action, but still in a scenario where we are not having too much uh, you know, churn, which is something that we don't want to, uh, to deal with. That being said, what I just described was essentially the delete scenario for consolidation. The other scenario that we want to leverage is replace. So in the previous scenario, we had essentially the same VM size across the board, and we saw opportunities to leverage good real estate. In this scenario, we noticed that, just kind of describing what's on the screen here, we still have the same size VMs in this system, but there's a lot of space available. So even if we were to reduce to, uh, if we were to delete that last VM on the right, we would still have kind of open space that's available in that middle VM. So using the replace scenario, we're essentially able to spin up, using Carpenter, a new smaller VM that now better bin packs your compute in uh, the way that, again, saves you some dollars and cents. So really exciting aspects here. And next up, I'm going to invite my uh, team member here, Charlie, to now speak on a couple other areas of leveraging Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm Charlie. I'm from. Your phone. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Just grab my phone. Um, so I'm Charlie. I'm a software developer from Microsoft. I work on AKS and specifically for Carpenter and the upstream uh, Carpenter as well. So today I'm going to talk about another form of disruption called drift which in Carpenter you can think of somewhat similar to upstream's pods and their deployment spec. Where in Carpenter we are provisioning nodes. We have the node pool and node class, as we've talked about, that end up specifying the shape of the nodes that we want to be provisioning. In addition to this, Carpenter ends up going and provisioning a node claim in association with every single node that it ends up creating. Periodically, Carpenter will go and check to make sure that the node claim is still in the desired state along with your node pool and the node class. If it ends up ever detecting that there's been a drift in this and it's no longer matching your desired provisioning, it will go and mark the node claim as drifted. It will taint the underlying node to make sure no new workloads will get provisioned on it. And then it will go into an internal scheduling simulation where it will see what will happen to the cluster if we end up removing that node from the cluster. If it ends up detecting that the workload won't be able to be distributed onto the other existing nodes, it will go and pre-provision a new node to be able to handle that workload moving around. So in this example that we have here on the slide, we have a instance type, a capacity type of spot that we start out with. Maybe we end up deciding after a while that we want to move to something a little more stable for on-demand. How do we go about this? Well, 
we simply end up updating to on-demand in the node pool. We end up deploying that. Carpenter will end up detecting that there's now been a drift where our nodes are no longer desired to be in spot, and we want them to be on-demand. Carpenter will go through, and it will end up doing the exact um, approach where it will go and mark the nodes as drifted. It will end up removing them, the old ones. It will end up drifting them, and then it will drain them in a safe manner and move the workload over. OK, so we've talked a bit about disruption so far. You might be thinking, how do I end up actually handling this disruption? Because sometimes I might have instances where I can't handle disruption during certain hours, or maybe there's other variances within my disruption that I want to be able to control. This is where the concept of disruption budgets comes into play within Carpenter. This allows us to both specify the amount of disruption we want, when we want this, that disruption to happen, and the reasons that we want that disruption to actually apply to. So in this example, it might be a little hard to see from the back of the room, but let's say that we don't want our workload to be disrupted during business hours. We can't tolerate that. Well, now we can end up setting a disruption budget for zero nodes to be disrupted during business hours for both drifted and underutilized. In this scenario, the consolidation that Wilson was just talking about for underutilized nodes, we've decided that we don't want to allow that nor drifted during those business hours. However, we still want to make sure that our cluster is always running as price efficiently as possible. So we still want to allow empty nodes to be removed. In this case, we'll set a disruption budget for 100% for the empty nodes to occur at any time. This will ensure that those nodes are getting cleaned up as soon as possible and removed from the cluster. We also still do want to set a general disruption budget for drifted and underutilized nodes for the general case as well. We end up deciding that a 10% budget for that is acceptable for the rest of the time. So we end up setting a general budget for drifted and underutilized for 10%. Now you might be thinking, OK, well, I now have an actual conflicting two budgets here for drifted and underutilized, both for my business hours and the general case. How does Carpenter handle this? If Carpenter ends up ever detecting that there is a conflict within the disruption budgets, it'll always end up choosing the most restrictive of those budgets to ensure you're never getting more disruption than you anticipate. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Chance, who's going to introduce the workshop to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chance Lee. We, today, we have two environments that you guys test Carpenter on. One is on EKS, one is on AKS. For EKS environment, AWS account is pre-provisioned uh, pre uh, pre with all necessary resources. You guys can copy just one of URLs here, and then it will redirect you to the event access page. And if you like to test Carpenter on AKS, you can follow the instruction uh, here. But you need to have your own account, and you need to have your own Azure subscription. I will quickly show uh, the instruction so you guys can follow. And please raise your hand if you need any help. And before we get started to the workshop, I wanted to quickly um, introduce our environments a little bit. Again. In a, on AWS, uh, we have AWS account already pre-deployed pre, uh, you know, pre for you, so you don't have to worry about it. And we will automatically terminate at the un, end of the day today. And please do not upload any of your personal information on the account. So let me quickly demo how to access the lab environment on AWS. If you copy one of the URLs, and if uh, the slide is too small, or you know, if you don't have the chance to copy and paste the URLs, we uploaded the PDF file on the KubeCon, our 
our session so you can download and copy and paste. So first, copy and paste one of tiny URLs. I will use EKS200. You need to only use one URL. We have multiple URLs because each event has different capacity we can use to, but just use one of the URLs. Tinyurl.com slash um, tiny.com and EKS slash 200 or EKS 400 or EKS slash 600. So if you click one of the um, tiny URL, it will redirect you to the workshop studio environment. In my case, I'm already logged in with my email address, but you can use your own email address to sign in first and then accept the term and conditions. And join event. And once you join the event by logging in with your email address, uh, you will be able to see event outputs on the, on the, on the console. So if, and this ID is, will be used to do the hands-on lab today. This ID environment has the tools already per, you know, installed to interact with the EKS cluster. So copy the ID URL. And then copy the ID password. And, and you can go to Workshop Studio, uh, Workshop Setup on the left-hand side uh, to follow the, the instruction that I just explained. So in a nutshell, copy one of the URLs and then sign in with your email address and then follow the Workshop Setup uh, instructions. If you go to Workshop Studio, uh, Workshop Setup instruction on the left-hand side, it has all the instructions that I just explained. So follow this and open, you can open AWS account, open AWS console, and you can open ID environment to run commands during the workshop. AWS console is not really required for this hands-on lab. You can open it to test to see the console as well, but everything will be done on IDE environment. So copy and paste the URLs, follow the instructions, and then open IDE and enter the password in your environment and start the hands-on lab. Uh, as we have multiple modules here, it's not possible to complete every modules within a given time, although we are going to open up the environment by end of this day. Um, but I would recommend to follow this route. If you are new to Carpenter, if you haven't done any hands-on with Carpenter at all, then please follow. Uh, install Carpenter, and then go to basic node pools, which has the basic core concepts of Carpenter. And the second one is cost optimizations with some of the consolidations or spot instance or Graviton that you can further optimize your cost on Carpenter environment. And if you are advanced, if you already use Carpenter, then follow the advanced route. You can skip the basic node pools, just install Carpenter, and then follow the cost optimization and uh, scheduling constraint section. If you have any question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, our supporter will, will help you out. Again, I will just share this. So you can copy in URLs and start the hands-on lab. Um, we also have the uh, track to go through Azure as well if you want to try out Carpenter on Azure. Um, one of the really nice things about Carpenter is with it being an open source project that we have um, the kind of core kernel of the code is within the upstream along with AWS and AKS both having their own provider on top is all of the concepts really translate across uh, clouds, which is really wonderful. Um, if you do want to check it out on Azure, either one should be great. You should get um, solid experience with both. Basically, it will require you to have your own Azure account um, and personal subscription for it. However, if you follow um, the link on screen for that as well, there basically will be a couple steps that will outline the different exact same steps that Chance just ended up going over, 
uh, for the different tracks that you can follow through. There's some links where we actually like share over some stuff between the AWS and Azure documentation because there is so much similar similarity between it. There's just a few specific cloud specific things that you need to do. Um, but all of that's documented within uh, scripts there. And if you follow things over there, the environment that you'll end up using is Cloud Shell within the Azure portal. There's a link to setting up that, and it should be as simple as clicking on that link, selecting the subscription that you're using, and then just putting in the installation scripts, and all of that should flow pretty seamlessly. However, if you have any issues with that, just raise your hand, and happy to come help you out. Uh, and to that point, uh, we do have some Azure team members in the room as well to offer any assistance. So if you have any questions Azure related, definitely let us know. It looks like we have one over here. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and if you have any AWS questions as well, we have team members here to resolve. Okay. Charlie, could you help that? You don't actually open up the console for the last. Yeah. All the uh, no. Yeah, yeah, you all don't the really need will be done by IDE. Uh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you can do it through IDE. You don't really have to put the IDE tab. It's just. Uh, I don't know if you have to make an account to do it. Uh, just again, you don't need to open AWS console. Every instructions can be done through the IDE, and all the lab instructions will be um, on left-hand side of the environment that you accessed. So again, copy just one of URLs. Copy one of tiny URL, and then copy it to browser. And use your email address to sign in and agree with terms and condition, join the event. And if you scroll down, 
So you can see all the lab instructions on the left-hand side. And just scroll down, copy ID URL, and copy IDE password to access to your IDE environment. Then follow the lab instructions on your left-hand side. Yeah, please raise your hand if you need any further help. So if you open AWS console, it will redirect you to the AWS console with the account that we deployed it. But again, you don't need to access the console for the lab. Yeah, you just need IDE. Yep. Just in case they would need. Yep. Just in case they would want. Just click here, then it yep. will automatically log in. Yeah. Tell them this. Ah, uh, yeah, but no. they have to. Yeah. And they some can people, okay. Some people would do that. Um, if anyone has problem access the lab environment, please raise your hand. We are here here to help you out. So, yeah. Yeah, you just need to copy the tiny URL, one of tiny URLs. Yeah, just copy the tiny URLs. Um, just tiny URL, um, maybe EKS 400 or, yeah. yeah let's do this. I, I got that. Um, it got already injected. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we can follow, you can scroll down. And uh, agree terms, join okay. event. And then uh, scroll down, uh, copy ID URL. Copy it, and uh, copy password. You, you had a password in the previous. Uh, yeah, 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 correct, yeah. yeah. And then uh, all the labs will be done on this, you know, ID environment, and the lab instructions was, was on the left-hand side. Those are the lab instructions. The follow install carpenter, basic node pool, cost optimization. Yeah, yeah. And let us know for any help. Yeah, sure. Everyone is 
for students and also uh, for teachers. So it's working, yeah? yeah. This is the problem with that. But where do we have chargers? I don't know if we You can announce. Oh, you announce. <laughs> <laughs> Side of the room. Yeah. There's a charger? Yeah, on the there wall. Like on the the walls. Walls. Ah. Uh, but um, but they, in that case, they cannot do the hands on that. They bring like mm. charger or laptop thing. But they would move. Like, um, ah. so if you said, like, OK, my laptop is dying, so okay. it's better other than. We yeah. haven't turned this off yet. Uh, the power outlets are on the wall, so if you need power for your laptop, um, might be good to move to the wall where the powers are uh, available. Uh, but please let us know if you need any additional yeah, battery. There are also a couple tables in the front with outlets. So if you need to relocate to the front, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, when you run EKS node viewer, which is a tool to show the node status and the pending parts and part schedules, you may hit uh, enter, you may have permission adders, but just please ignore that. You can still proceed the, the labs. And again, please let us know for any helps. Can make the new job. So carpenter will provision work in this way, and the work in this way can be done for four weeks if it's more job to to get some of the things done that so we can do that. Yes. How long will we keep them in line?
Hi, uh, for anyone who would like to access the instructions after this workshop, um, you can search Carpenter Workshop on Google, and you can show this link, which will direct you to the instruction page. You can just click Get Started, then you will see the same instruction that we, uh, we did today. Only thing is there is no AWS account or there's no IDE created, so you need to test on your own, own account. Uh, the IDE environment will be terminated at the end of today, so you can test out if you know you, you need, you'd like to test more. Uh, but again, if you like to review the instructions after the workshop, just search Carpenter Workshop on Google, and this instructions is on uh, is is public, so you can access and also reach us out for. Any question you may have, um, here's our yeah, here's our social information. So please reach us out for for any question you may have. Yeah, thank you.